Good morning. Thank you for uh, joining us today. I'm Kathy Newcomer. I'm the director of the Trachtenberg School of Public Policy and Public Administration here at GW. So we welcome you to GW. And we welcome those uh, folks who are online. We're very glad that you're joining us too. And I hope that you'll have a lot of questions too. So the Trachtenberg School is a graduate uh, school. Uh, with math, with uh, three master's degrees and a PhD, all focused on uh, public service and improving our society. And if you want to know any more about it, just just ask me. But um, grants management is clearly a very important topic for our um, for our government at all levels, since so much of what we do is done by grants, over 640 billion dollars at the federal level. A lot of the money goes out in grants, and a lot of Americans don't know that. I'm sure my family in the Midwest has no clue how much work is done by contract uh, with at all levels of government. That would be a reasonable thing to say. Uh, the people in this room and online know how important it is and how um, challenging it can be. So uh, it's wonderful that we partner with REI to have these breakfasts to get people to sort of have a community of practice to talk to each other and get to know people in other agencies and so that you can learn from each other. So thank you for being here. Jeff? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so first, for those of you who haven't been here before, because there are a bunch of new faces in the room, the purpose of these events really is to build a community of grants managers, to give you some other faces and names that you can say, hey, I've got this sort of problem, and you've had that problem or challenge before, what did you do about it, how did it work, so that you can learn from each other, and of course so that you can learn from folks who've had quite a significant amount of experience and are amongst those that we uh, invite as presenters. Um, now, one of the things I've talked with you, a number of you about is, and I'll encourage you now, these uh, conversations are always much more interesting if they are just that conversation. So please ask questions where you're uncertain or you want to know about experience. And don't just, hesitate to, don't, don't just ask questions of the panelists because there are other folks who are in the audience who have as much or more experience in many arenas as some of the panelists and certainly as, as I do. Um, so you feel, feel free to ask questions of each other. I'd also like to encourage you to say, hey, here's a topic that's upcoming that I'm really interested in uh, that I think is going to be a big challenge for us in the future. Can you help find a speaker who will come and tell us about their experience, their successes, their challenges in this other arena or this other topic so that we can kind of make sure that the upcoming events are interesting to you. Um, and on that line, actually, on March 21st, we're going to have a senior director, Michelle Sager, from the General Account the Government Accountability Office, sorry, I'm dating myself, uh, from the Government Accountability Office talking about audit issues for grant makers. And essentially kind of where is it that grant makers have run into trouble, how is it that they've addressed and what are some of the best practices. And again, she'll be here kind of in our usual format of one speaker offering you some in-depth background experience and, and kind of uh, anecdotes, and we'll invite your questions to that. But if you say, hey, there's another topic I'd like to hear about or an agency or person, then we'd love to hear your suggestions for those, and we'll try and arrange the future events to kind of meet your needs and interests. Um, let me give you a brief kind of the 30-second advertisement and, and background about REI Systems. Uh, our company provides a variety of grants management solutions, and we actually are continuing to work with new clients. We've just begun work with the U.S. Agency for International Development in their grant management, uh, and that makes actually a significant portion, I think more than 10 civilian agencies we work with helping make grants. As well, we provide an off-the-shelf software solution to state governments. Uh, so, for example, our most recent uh, uh, in instance of that is with the state of Utah and their Board of Education. And one of the things I think might be interesting about that to you is that it creates what I'm beginning to see as an opportunity to both reduce burden but improve grants performance across communities. And that is what I kind of think of as vertical integration. So if you imagine almost any school district will typically have a student record system with information in an electronic format about students and their achievement. And at that school district level, it may be possible to report that back up to the state when the state grants money to the school district. And those states may then, in turn, be able to report that information in summary format up to the U.S. Department of Education. And when you have that information coming from an automated source to begin with, it tends to be more credible, more reliable, more valid, and less painful because you're not asking people to type it in or make up the information. And so in our minds, that's a great opportunity. It's not there yet, but it's something we're kind of looking forward to in the two to three to five year range of saying, how can we both reduce burden of grant reporting but increase accountability, understanding, and the direction of effort so that the effort more often goes into things like how do we improve programs? Can we provide technical assistance? How do we find where really the best practices are taking place? 
and get that information filtering all the way up and down throughout the grant ecosystem so that the money and the selection of grantees goes to the places where the best results are being obtained. And similarly, the knowledge about how to get good results is shared effectively with the people who are having trouble or uncertain or just new to the business. Um, the last point I want to mention actually about REI is that we're very proud of our innovation history. Uh, we've been around 30 years now working with a variety of grant makers, starting out with our very first one 30 years ago with NASA, with whom we continue to work today. And this past year, uh, a client of REI's, the Health Resources and Services Administration, won the first place out of more than 100 federal nominees for the Igniting Innovation Award made by ACT-IAC, the American Council for Technology uh, Industry Advisory Councils. And that award essentially was for gathering performance information from health-related grantees and providing that on a timely basis to folks at the Health Resources and Services Administration, again, so they could do a better job providing technical assistance do a better job setting their grant selection criteria, and be more effective at helping achieve health outcomes and improvements in health amongst disadvantaged populations. So that's kind of about it for REI. Um, what I'm going to do next, I'll give you just a kind of a quick overview of the agenda, and then uh, I'll uh, uh, introduce, uh, actually I'll invite my colleague to introduce herself. Um, our agenda essentially is that uh, my colleague and I are going to present kind of the results of our annual grants management survey. Um, this is something where we thought about kind of two or three years ago, where can we get good information about the state of grants management, the needs of the community, what people are looking forward to, what they found successful and, and what not. And we didn't find it anywhere. We talked with OMB, we talked with GAO, we talked with HHS, several other major grants agencies in the federal government, and they said, you know, something like that doesn't exist. So we thought, let's get together with the Trachtenberg School and Kathy Newcomer here at George Washington University and create such a survey. And we appreciate that many of you have responded to that survey. We hope that you do and that you share it with your colleagues in the future. And so we're here today to tell you not only what are the results of the survey, but also kind of what we think it means to a minor extent. And we've invited panelists to help you understand what they think it means. Uh, and the panel construction is actually very intentional. We've got a federal competitive grant maker. We've got a federal block and formulaic grant maker. We've got a state representative who is both a grant recipient and a pass-through grant maker, as well as a grant originator in their own right in many instances. And we've got a representative of nonprofits, actually the National Grants Management Association, who kind of is here to represent a variety of nonprofit, primarily grant recipients, but also has a pretty good understanding of things like human capital and expertise within the grants management industry as well. Um, one of the things I want to encourage you to do, though, is ask questions of the panelists. We'll have a few questions. We hope you will have more questions. Um, so. And actually, you know, I don't know that I've ever really introduced myself and kind of why I'm here. So those of you who have been here before, maybe you haven't heard this. Those of you who are new, I'm sure you haven't heard this. Um, I uh, uh, went to a competing institution. Uh, I obtained my Master in Public Policy a little more than 30 years ago from the Kennedy School. And at that stage, I decided, you know, I was a little bit interested in research, but I wanted to be a consultant. Uh, my best friend, a math major, said, you know, Jeff, I know what you do. You, criti you criticize people, and they pay you for it. Um, but I decided that actually, more recently, a substantial part, as Kathy says, more than 20% of federal programs are funded and overseen through grants. This is a big chunk of the effort that the government does in terms of making sure that public mission outcomes are achieved. And I thought there's not enough attention to this. So I wanted to turn some of my focus towards this and to do so using some academic rigor, which is, of course, in, uh, in substantial part also why we're partnering with George Washington University. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, Rajuta, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, my name is Rajuta Marcus. I'm the Grants Offering Lead for REI. Um, I've been working in the Enterprise Grants Management System space for the last uh, six uh, years or so, um, helping clients, federal clients, uh, manage their grant systems um, and get the outcomes that they're looking for. So we're going to offer a little bit of an overview of the, re the, the analysis and the research findings, and then I'll introduce our panelists who will then come up and discuss. Um, so let me start out, uh, oops, there we go. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about methodology, kind of what folks you're hearing from, uh, and then the substance of the survey, how folks spend their time, performance and, and burden, essentially uh, topics that, by the way, this, this survey last year was uh, a piece of the President's Management Agenda Justification. Uh, the survey found that there was substantial concern about the amount of burden placed on grant managers by a variety of different kinds of regulations. So the President's Management Agenda said, this is the only information we have about that burden. This is why it's important that this is a presidential and administration priority to reduce burden. So our thinking is there's a good possibility something like that might occur again this year. 
Um, we're going to talk to you about the places where survey respondents felt most strongly, either in favor of something or against something, or something was a problem. Talk about what folks mentioned in the survey was some of their most significant challenges and problems they faced, what they thought was most important to success, and then just kind of have a quick executive summary at the end. And I'll uh, kind of do a little bit at the beginning, a little bit at the end, and Rajuna will talk kind of about the bulk of the substance. So just as background, the National Grants Management Association provides tools and resources and is a terrific support network, both electronically and in person, as well as a training network and provides certification for folks who are grants managers at all levels, whether they be nonprofit, state, local, federal, tribal, uh, and, and again, kind of no matter whether they have a program role, a financial role, kind of a grant professional role. Um, the Trachtenberg School, Kathy, is described a little bit, but essentially, again, we uh, find that uh, bluntly, I looked around in the Washington area to say, who is it, what institution is it that does work with grants? And almost every institution raised their hand and said, we do, and they were almost all about, we help people obtain grants, and we help them make sure they're in compliance so they don't lose their grants. And frankly, the Trachtenberg School was the only one that stood up and said, we are really interested in the practice of making grants and getting effective value for money as the federal government manages this major mechanism for delivering services. And then finally, REI systems I've kind of already talked about. Um, the purpose of the survey, I've kind of given you a little bit of an overview about, but is to identify the trends and identify things to help you give it a, a perspective on, is this a problem I'm facing alone, or do a lot of my peers face it? And eventually, we're kind of contemplating, I'll ask you maybe again at the end of this session, should we reduce the anonymity? Because right now, all the responses are anonymous. If they were not anonymous, we recognize that might impact participation, but it might also give us a chance to say, hey, you know what, these 12 respondents said they really succeeded in this area. Perhaps we would be willing, and if they are willing, to share their contact information so that other folks who had a problem in this area can contact them. So we'll ask you again, and you can again share your thoughts with me afterwards about should we <coughs> take away that and uh, at least make it optional as to whether or not you're anonymous. Um, the survey administration was primarily during the month of November. We invited a large group, more than 5,000 folks, to complete the survey. We don't restrict who, a, who a completes it. You could be a person who's a kind of a, a clerical worker at Walmart and complete the survey. But on the other hand, it goes out from the Office of Management Budget. It's posted on grants.gov. We send it to a contact list of more than 5,000 folks who are in the pro professionals in the grant management arena. And if you say, hey, you know what? I didn't get it. Please share with us your contact information. We'll make sure that you get it next year. <clears throat> um, so the other pieces, of course, of this, if you're a serious researcher that are self-evident, this is not a stratified, randomly selected sample upon which we can extrapolate with validity to a larger population. Sorry, it's not. Uh, Responsible norms. Um, we had the best response rate we've ever had, more than 450 responses. We had actually about 600 people start the survey, but 440 finished it. Uh, a significant portion of them, the largest portion, were from the state level, 138. We had a significant portion, 75 from uh, federal, 80 from local, a few from tribal and from other uh, sorts of entities like associations, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, a bunch from nonprofits and associations, and I've forgotten what the other are. Um, what was interesting to me about this is that um, Although it's not easy to see, this is the block that's zero to two years, this is the block that's more to 10 years, is, I'm sorry, 10 or more years. Of the folks who chose to respond, which again is not necessarily representative, we saw that this block shrank, and that there is some new blood coming in, more new blood this year than was the case in previous years. So I thought that was kind of interesting. You know, there, apparently there's some hiring going on, and people are kind of more often seeking to get into the grants management field. So we were pleased about that, at least again, based on those who chose to respond to the survey. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rajuta and invite you. Oh, I'm supposed to do one more slide. I always forget exactly what I'm supposed to do. Um, okay, so the, this is essentially kind of the question of where do you spend your time. And so this is, again, just a little bit of a chance to give you a sense of, well, am I looking really similar to a bunch of other folks in the community or not? Um, and there's one significant thing that happened. The first two blocks are uh, monitoring financial requirements, monitoring non-financial administrative requirements. And those are the top two. And what's slightly interesting is, it used to be last year, it was the monitoring financial and program policy and design were the top two, they flipped. And what that tells me is that actually, if you're doing a lot of administrative work, you're not unusual, first. Second, the administrative burden is not easy enough. And so a lot of the kind of things that we're going to ask the panel to talk a little bit about are, what can be done about the administrative burden? 
Does it require coordination between the federal level and the state level or between different federal agencies? And I'd like to encourage you in the audience to help think about and contribute to that discussion as well. Um, so we have a variety of other sorts of things, but the bottom line is last year when this drove the president's management agenda's attention to say, how can we reduce burden? Burden has not been reduced, at least not yet. Maybe not surprising, the president's management agenda came out kind of middle of the year. But the second is, I think, frankly, no one has a really good picture of how we can reduce burden. And that, I think, is kind of one of the two or three big topics for the Grants Management Committee in the next couple of years, which is, what can we do to reduce burden so that people can spend more time developing programs, improving programs, training staff, providing technical assistance, helping fix problems, and less time simply doing kind of the check the box report. So that's one of the big takeaways. I'll give you a kind of a preview. One of the big takeaways that I think will be really important, and again, we would love to have your input, as well as, of course, the input from our panels. Is it your turn now? Yes. Okay, perfect. And we're gonna, I apologize, we're gonna go through the entirety of the slides because we probably wouldn't get through them at all. Um, we'll try and do that in about 15 or 20 minutes with respect to the survey results. And then we will turn to the panelists and invite their discussion and your questions. Okay, um, so the next um, topic that we'd like to talk about is actually a new question we introduced this past year. And it's about whether uh, you know that your or your grantee's performance has actually improved in the last 12 months. So the interesting thing here, um, and I'll just talk about the data a little bit. The purple represents uh, the I don't know response from respondents. The red and the blue represents it did improve, but it was less than 5% or um, more than 5%. And the green represents did not improve at all. So the interesting thing here is that the state and local and non-government organizations mostly said that it did improve in some way or the other. I think on the federal side, we see a lot of I don't know. The majority uh, of the I don't knows came from the federal respondents. So that is another question that we'd like to uh, think about in the panel uh, session. But why do we think that there is so much of um, uh, uncertainty or lack of knowledge in terms of the performance outcomes on the federal respondent side? The next topic um, was about the self uh, uh, data collection mechanisms. So not surprisingly, self-reported quarterly data was the most common way of collecting uh, data from the grantees. Uh, the uh, colors here represent quarterly is for blue, red is annual, and green is episodic. Uh, and on the bottom you see qualita quantitative, qualitative, and then third party qualitative and quantitative data. So the maximum data, again, not surprising given the uh, federal financial reports, the progress reports that are collected on a quarterly basis, it is quantitative self-reported data that happens to be the data collection mechanism of choice across the board. The data that was uh, collected, how, which one of it was the most timely, useful, and reliable? Uh, the, uh, again, not surprisingly, the financial data for performance outcome measurement was the most timely, uh, useful, and reliable. But is that the right kind of data to collect to measure outcomes, or should it be program data, performance data, which is actually represented on the far right with the non-administrative data columns? So we see <coughs> we see that performance measurement, uh, performance outcomes is uh, measured primarily looking at the financial data across all of the respondents. Um, there were some topics that were um, uh, scored very high in the survey, which means that respondents felt very strongly about. Uh, the first one is that um, everyone felt, and more so than last year, that uh, states and uh, the federal systems need to automate data more. Um, what that means and how we automate it is a, a discussion that we'd love to have in the second half of the session. But clearly the answers of people are looking for more and more automation in that, in that data. Um, we saw a similar amount of respondents uh, say that they are using risk-based uh, uh, strategies to manage their grantees. So that is encouraging. We're happy to see that uh, a lot of them are already using risk-based plans to manage the performance uh, of their grantees. 
um, leadership and executives continue to be interested in data and collecting data and uh, monitoring data and analytics. So that is good. Uh, we saw the interest actually increase this past year. Uh, the uh, charts on the bottom, the green bar is 2018. So we know that the, that interest in data collection, analytics, and measuring using data is increasing. Um, however, having said that, uh, there are some areas where uh, grantees are, or respondents are looking for more improvement in that uh, mechanism. Um, this, this particular item is dissatisfaction or the satisfaction with identifying and managing risks for program goals will not be accomplished is uh, the satisfaction level was the lowest which means that respondents are looking for better ways to manage their program goals uh, and uh, manage the risks around achieving those program goals. <coughs> However, um, the confidence that grantees will be able to um, meet their program objectives has also slipped a little. So on the right hand side, if you see 2018 has lower scores than past years in terms of confidence in being able to meet those goals. Um, from feedback mechanisms from grantees, we saw that overwhelmingly 80%, almost 80% of the respondents are relying on the annual reporting uh, pro progress report uh, uh, process to actually collect data about, or get feedback about their grants. Um, a lot of them, about 60, are using emails as well. But the question is, is that is that really the right way or the right uh, process to collect feedback about your grant program? through the annual reporting uh, process. Is there, are there other ways? Are there surveys? Are there other mechanisms that we could use to actually get feedback about how the grant program is going, not just the performance or the progress of the grant team? Um, as we said before, uh, the automation interest is there, but people feel like there's still a long way to go. <coughs> uh, we see that almost 75% of grantees said that they are still sending in uh, their reports in an email form or in some form or the other. So whether they might have automation on, let's say, the financial reports, but for progress or performance reports, they're sen still sending in over emails. So that increases the burden, that makes, makes everyone track things manually. There's a lot of um, uh, time spent in those kind of activities. A lot of respondents said that they have centralized systems, but many have program-specific systems. So um, getting all of that centralized and then pushing information from one to another becomes a, a manual aspect. And then overall, the grant system satisfaction is pretty low. Um, of all the topics, when you break that down in terms of what does that satisfaction entail, the access to technology and uses, the usage of technology was actually you know, not too bad. The scores were pretty medium. However, most of the uh, state and local and non-government grantees said that the cost to the technology for reporting into the federal systems was where they uh, felt the most challenges and struggled the most. So what the question really here is what can we do to either reduce the cost or make that easier for the state, local, non-governments to report into the federal systems. So that's another topic we might uh, discuss in the panel session a little bit later. Okay. So the uh, challenges um, are substantially similar to last year, but a little different. And the biggest challenge, surprise, surprise, is folks are uncertain about funding and kind of wondering, how do I structure my program and how do I succeed when I really have no idea? Is it going to get zeroed out? Is it going to get a substantial funding hike? What kind of priority is it going to be? It's interesting, though, that that's a little bit of less of a concern. This year in blue, 62% indicated that was one of the biggest concerns, whereas last year, 72%. So it's calming down a little bit, but that's still a big issue. And so that's actually something we did cheat a little. We've had a couple of discussions with our panelists beforehand, so they're going to be prepared to give you some suggestions and ideas about how to deal with that. And again, we'll encourage folks in the audience to, uh, to uh, address that as well. Um, what I found a little bit interesting as well is that, uh, as I kind of hinted, there's some increase, it's a small issue, but nevertheless some increase in the uh, worry about grantees who are inexperienced with the program. And to me, actually that may be a good thing, because what that means is, again, maybe we're getting in some fresh blood, 
some new grant managers, and we need to think about kind of how to get them up to speed. Um, which will actually key into a kind of a, a little bit of a different part of the discussion because one of the things you'll see in a moment is high quality or well-qualified staff is one of the things that people most appreciated about their situation in grant management in this entire survey. And so the question that kind of arose in my mind was, well, what is well-qualified and how do we assure we got well-qualified? Because then, of course, that to a certain extent kind of will play right into this issue. Um, so but then let's look at that, which is, and I'm, I'm going through these fairly quickly to kind of make sure that we have plenty of time for the discussion. I do want to emphasize these are available right now online to the folks who are, visit, who are, are participating via live stream. These slides are going to be available to all of you as well. You can download them or I can email them to you or what have you. And for those of you who have a really deep down, uh, uh, strong interest, we'll be happy to share with you the kind of the full survey results for each question so that if you'd like to, you can do whatever analysis you care to do. This is just kind of the analysis we thought would be most interesting to the larger audience. Um, so these are the things that are kind of the success factors, and the question was, what are the three things that are most important to your success where you have that as a grant manager? And so this is what came out. And as you see, the top item, although uh, up just a little since last year, down a little since the year before, is having a well-qualified grant management staff. Um, the other items that are significant, as you can see, is effective training or technical assistance, uh, having the, uh, uh, you know, a clear law, and I guess this one, which is kind of having an efficient or effective method for overseeing grantee activity and performance. Um, and so the question again is, well, kind of, well, what is that efficient or effective method? And again, I'm hoping that some of you can share your specific suggestions or experiences on that. Um, so the kind of the bottom line summary, and again, we're trying to keep this relatively short with the presentation. We're happy to answer questions about the survey analysis, but I think the discussion of the panelists will be much more interesting for most of you is, still the case that the most significant use of time in the grant management community is compliance. And there's still, I think, a sense from several different perspectives that, you know, that isn't right. We want to actually spend more time helping people succeed as opposed to just make sure they stick within the narrow bounds of what's permissible or not. We'd like it to make it easier. We realize it's important to stick within those bounds of what is compliant, but we'd like to make it easier to do that. And again, my emphasis is you all may be able to say, here's how that's possible. And it's perhaps uh, possible that you know, some research may be engendered as a result of this uh, that would say here are some ways that are more economical and less burdensome to achieve that compliance. And so we think this is kind of an indication for OMB, there are at least one or two folks from OMB who may be participating by live stream if they're not here in person. This is an area that deserves interest. Um, the second topic, and this is one that Rajuda mentioned, which is I was astounded I thought, well, you know what? The Government Performance and Results Act has been around for years. Why don't we have performance measures? Well, it turns out, of course, as you're aware probably, GIPRA applies to federal spending on federal activities. It doesn't apply to grantees. <coughs> and the question then someone might ask is, well, but the Data Act is coming. And the Data Act is going to require standard grants data. And you know what? <coughs> it's almost all financial data. And the way that OMB is defining those standard terms right now is standard financial terms that will make it possible across the federal government and to a significant extent up and down the chain with state grantees, local grantees, nonprofits is just financial data. There is no standard set of definitions for program or performance with respect to grants and grant performance. Um, and so I think that's an issue because again, this is a significant, a huge portion of discretionary spending for the federal government in many instances. In some cases, it's not discretionary. But it's a significant issue, which is we're spending a lot of money, we don't know what we're getting for it, and, you know, frankly, acquisitions and contracts and procurements are subject to kind of some malfeasance here and there, so they tend to get a lot of attention from auditors and the public and the media. Grants, not so much. Does that mean that programs operated through grant funding are less important? I don't think so. I think they're some of the most important programs we have. So the big issue is what can we do about strengthening performance in ways that are not burdensome and that will hopefully be useful across the grant management community and not just useful in one agency. And again, I don't think there's an answer right now, but I think this is kind of the 64 million, 64,000, 64 million dollar question uh, for grants management over the next several years. Um, clear that grant managers want data sharing. And it's kind of funny because what we find, if those of you who aren't kind of thinking about this, is that there may be an entity, let's call it a state, that receives grants from several different federal grantors. Let's pretend six different federal agencies. And they may be providing the same information back in six different systems, in six different formats, with six different types of data, all addressing the same topic. Now again, the Data, the data Act 
and the GREAT Act may address that, and the OMB standards that are coming out may address that on financial topics, but they're not going to address it on performance or program or other sorts of topics. It might be a great idea to have a pilot and to say, let's see whether or not we can get two or three agencies together to collaborate, especially where we take the kind of the user-centric view. Let's pretend we're in the position of, or let's just invite in two or three states and say, you know, where is the most burden coming? Which agencies do you get grants from? What topics are the most frequently duplicated topics on which we could then say, let's coordinate and consolidate and get some standard data, and perhaps some standard automated tools to be able to vacuum that data up in a way that doesn't require a lot of human intervention, doesn't quite present a lot of risk of kind of data entry error or misunderstanding or misinterpretation. And then the last topic is, they realize that they want some sharing and automation across the grant management community. They aren't happy with the technology they've got and especially the cost of it. And that leads me to kind of think about, well, the big shared services question. Maybe not everybody wants to share services and kind of worry about their needs being at the bottom of the totem pole. But on the other hand, if you're, for example, a department at the federal level, a cabinet level department that's making grants to state and local governments, you could invite every one of those state level governments or local recipients to go procure their own grant management solution, or you could provide it. Or you could do a blanket purchase agreement that says, here are the two or three conforming software opportunities, and we negotiate at an effective price. So my sense is that this last one, again, it's a big issue for the grant recipients. No one in the federal community seems to really be thinking much or doing much about it. And I think the grant recipients will have a hard time doing something about it themselves. And so it may be a place where some federal leadership is appropriate, whether it be in an individual department or perhaps some consolidation, a group of departments, or a kind of an over government oversight entity. Uh, last, and this one I think is interesting, and it's a little bit of a kind of throwing a bone to OMB, which is, I think, warranted in this case. Believe it or not, some people appreciate regulation. And in this case, the bottom line is that much of the guidance and the regulation around grants management actually is appreciated. And in fact, it's growing in terms of appreciation. Most of the blue lines, with one or two exceptions you see, are longer this year than they were last year, telling, you, telling us that people are appreciating the Data Act more and more. They're finding the Gone Act valuable. They found the Uniform Grants Guidance the most valuable, although that shrank a little bit between last year. My reading is that the cap goal eight and the kind of the results-oriented accountability for grants and grant standards, people haven't seen the impact enough yet. It's too fresh to have that be really a long line. But 24% of the folks found that this was extremely or moderately positive. So again, there is, I think, some value in the guidance that's being offered and the standardization that is being offered by the federal government, in particular, especially in cases where there's kind of a government-wide coordination. So I think that's beneficial. Um, but let me now, <clears throat> that we've shared with you the kind of the results of the survey, uh, let me introduce our panelists and then uh, start inviting questions. Um, I'll ask one or two questions to kind of get things kicked off, and then we'll invite questions from the audience. John? What's your GG? Uniform Grant Guidance. Sure. Okay, so for the panelists, <coughs> we have, and if the panelists would care to join us at the table here, um, we have from a federal agency that makes block and formula grants, Stan Gimont, who is a Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Housing and Urban Develop Department of Housing and Urban Development, who is the farthest over at the moment. And Stan has uh, the honor of being a graduate of the George Washington University program here at the Trockenberg School and joined the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development as a presidential management intern. I think it was PMI at that point still, and not PMF. Uh, and has been at HUD for a good long time since, working in and around the grants community. Uh, on his immediate right, we have <coughs> Brian Smith. And Brian is a federal competitive grant maker and also deals with a couple of other types of grants uh, at the Economic Development Administration. Uh, Ryan is uh, someone who is responsible more heavily for research and technical assistance, uh, helping make sure the grants succeed, and after graduating from the Maxwell School, a competitor, I'm sorry, uh, has uh, worked at the Environmental Protection Agency, at NIST, at the Office of Secretary, and of course within Economic Development Administration, EDA, within the Department of Commerce. Uh, let's see, to Stan's left we have Shelley Slubrich who is the executive director of the National Grants Management Association, uh, and again has got a careful interest and a long interest in helping grant managers succeed at all levels, state, local, nonprofit, uh, helping expand the capabilities through training and uh, support for a variety of grant management professionals, and offers a uh, certification program if someone is interested in becoming certified as a grant manager. Uh, 
And finally, on the far left, we have Jennifer Colton, who is the director of the Governor's Office of Grants for the State of Maryland, and has worked with the Office of Chief of Staff and the Governor in Maryland for a significant period of time, I believe as long as the current Governor has been in office, and has, uh, again, got responsibility, and this may be interesting to you, but you think, you know, I think myself, Stan with HUD does, what is it, $6 billion, $6.5 billion a year worth of grants for HUD? Jennifer's agency, the state of Maryland, oversees $12 billion a year of grants. Is it 12? Is it? Yeah, 12 billion. So what we don't think about is that path through responsibility of both receiving grants from multiple agencies as well as originating some and passing them through tends to be a pretty substantial job. So we've got kind of panelists who have these variety of different sorts of expertise. And uh, I think that they hopefully will be able to kind of provide you with a variety of types of perspectives, but again, should not substitute for your own perspective. Um, so I'm going to kick it off with one or two questions, and I'm going to flip back through to the beginning of the slides. Um, but again, at, at any point you can say, hey, I'm curious and I want to go back and talk about this topic or that topic, we can flip through and find them. Um, but the question here to start with is, grant managers spend a whole lot of their time on compliance. And there are concerns about, well, are we really kind of, is that the best use of time? And so what I wanted to do to start with is to kind of ask each of our panelists, essentially, what can be done about this? And so to start with, maybe we can ask uh, uh, Stan and Ryan to think about, well, from a federal grantor perspective, what could be done to reduce the amount of effort and time that must be spent on compliance? Um, I don't know. Brian, you're closest. Do you want to <laughs> want to kick things off? Um, sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that we struggle with at, at EDA is the duplicate data entry, right? And so duplicate data entry creates problems, creates problems that cascade throughout the grant process and throughout the workflow process. So if you could find an effective way to populate, say, administrative data into the pre-award process, that's one of the things that would drastically cut down on errors that cascade throughout the process that then need to be corrected, go back, found. Um, streamlining which pre-award checklist requirements you need to um, you need to go through in order to make the award, right? It's it's not looking in, you know, we look in several databases at this point in time before we can make an award. And so as we're going through that due diligence, you know, we're looking in SAM, we're looking in FAPIS, we're looking in multiple databases, we're looking in multiple areas, and it would be awesome to just go through to, you know, grantsdudiligence.com and uh, have all of those things populated for me so that I I can check that against my award documents. Good. Sure. So thank you, Jeff. Uh, let me just first say that I uh, appreciate the inv invitation to be here this morning. I'm here on my own, not <laughs> representing the department, and the uh, views expressed are my own today. But uh, as I deal primarily with uh, state and local government, I mean, it's a bit, bit of a different uh, scenario than, than working with a competitive uh, set of grants. Uh, our grantees are fairly familiar with their uh, their requirements. That doesn't mean to say that they are uh, as simple to deal with, or uh, uh, and that uh, they can uh, easily be be altered. Um, we have taken uh, a lot of effort over a period of time at HUD to examine what our what our options are with respect to uh, uh, sort of front end issues with with these grants uh, and. One of the things we keep running into are a variety of statutory constraints with regard to uh, that burden. So while we've tried to minimize those those burdens to the greatest extent possible, we continue to run into a, a range of statutory constraints that have been built up over 30, 40 years in some cases with regard to the programs that we're responsible for. So uh, on that front, again, it's, it's difficult to, to put your finger on, on specific administrative requirements that, that uh, are, are particularly problematic for our grantees because we have already made that effort to uh, minimize what we're requesting from them on the front end. Let me ask just a brief follow-up, Stan. I, I realize that occasionally an agency is a little bit shy about asking for a statutory change that would kind of, to a certain extent, maybe reduce the control that Congress has in some instances. And it always strikes me that it might be easier to find kind of an outside third party to advocate for that. 
So if, if I were going to say, Stan, you know, should it be HUD? Should it be some sort of outside entity that kind of advocates for that statutory change? Who do you think would be the right entity to kind of advocate for that? From, again, from the perspective of the uh, grantees that I work with, it's really <coughs> going to have to be the, uh, the interest of groups that represent state and local government saying that these are particular issues that would need to be addressed mm -hmm. in order to uh, improve the, uh, <coughs> the process on the front end. So uh, you know, where we find ourselves in somewhat of a difficult situation, uh, given uh, where the administration has been with regard to funding requests for some of the programs that we're responsible for, uh, and uh, to the extent that uh, we want to see change on some of these programs at this point in time, we're really looking for uh, uh, the recipient and, and the outside community to make, make advancement on those issues. Okay. So you're hearing it here, which is that associations of grant recipients may be the best place to have advocacy for legislative changes. And perhaps those could be through NGMA or perhaps otherwise. So Shelly, what about for, uh, for grant recipients and your uh, uh, kind of folks? What, what do you think are the best ways to reduce burden? I think what we're hearing is that if they know if they're not in compliance, they're going to lose their funding, which means their fundees are going to lose their funding. And it boils down to internal controls and monitoring. And you need good internal controls. And what we find is a lot of people think that they don't. And if it's all on paper and you don't know that it's there, it's not doing them any good. Okay. Jen? Yeah, and I'll piggyback on what Shelly's saying. You know, um, obviously there's been an increased burden, but you'll see, or you did see on the slides that folks were appreciative of the uniform guidance. And a lot of these compliance issues stem from these increased regulations and this new information. And so it's kind of like a catch-22 right now. Um, I think that a lot of folks haven't spent the time to implement those tools and processes that would really help, um, you know, kind of automate or can make those processes a little bit more consistent. And on the state level, our office is spending a significant amount of time with the agencies on providing these tools, providing this training, and making sure that you know, those, um, those uh, pathways to success are easier and that they have the tools that they need. Um, you know, and I think Jeff mentioned it as well as one of the key takeaways. Um, a lot of this stuff would be increased with technology, right? And with the technology, money would be helpful. And, you know, when you have the volume of grants that flow through like we do in the state with 60% of the budget, it takes a lot of time and energy from the agencies, but you'll also notice performance responses went up as well. So you have to assume that because we're monitoring compliance and, and that's a priority that folks understand that we're paying attention to those things and it, you know, it, affect, it would potentially affect their funding and they're tracking it and they're re reporting it in a way that they haven't done or haven't had to do in the past. And I think those are all good things. We just need to find the right tools and mechanisms to put in place across the board to make things consistent and a lot more easy for folks. Great, thanks. So let me emphasize, we have actually close to 80 folks who registered to participate via live stream. The folks who are on live stream are welcome to ask questions as well. There should be a chat box where you can type your question in and we'll have a person in the room who reads those and, and uh, uh, then uh, uh, phrases them out loud. Feel free to direct it to the panel in general or to an individual panelist if you'd like. Let me stop here just for a moment to see are there any folks who are in the audience in the room or on live stream who have questions about this topic, kind of where people spend their time. Yes. Hey, um, what's on the nation with Grant Thornton? I guess... And you're welcome to use the yeah. microphone if you like. It'll make it a little easier for the live stream sure, folks definitely. to hear. Um, uh, what's on the nation with Grant Thornton? Uh, I guess the major issue over here... Well, PMA talks about fiscal stewardship of grant dollars. And when you go down this list of requirements, 
you've got the traditional grant office activities and the program office activities. And I guess nowadays more and more there's a combination of the two. There's no longer a separate grant office and a programmatic office. So I guess that's where the challenges come that people just don't have enough time. Is that what you're observing? Is that why, you know, I mean, I feel like as a grants program manager, I would be definitely <coughs> worried about where my dollars are going and how. Uh, I, I al I've always had a challenge when people talk about monitoring financial, but that's the main duty of the grants program manager, monitoring the financials. And to an extent, everything else becomes secondary. So, so just is, is there a separate need for a programmatic versus somebody looking at program outcomes and somebody focusing just on you know the financial actions the compliance actions you know, do, you, do you think we need to keep that separation yeah i'll jump in um and uh sam makes a good point um that uh all views are my own. I'm here of my own accord. <laughs> <laughs> I do not represent the Department of Commerce's position on any of these particular issues. But uh, in my experience, I have I've worked on the financial side of grants management. I have worked on the programmatic side of grants management. And you, you can't focus on one at the expense of the other. Uh, I, I think um, it, it's true. Financial data is more prevalent. Financial data is easier to audit. Financial data is, uh, it's worth looking at, but there's a reason that there's more of it, right? That's an important function, and it's an important function for audit compliance. It's an important function for fraud detection. It's an important function for demonstrating that you recognize you're taking a dollar away from an American citizen and putting it into a public program and that there's a fiduciary responsibility for you to look after that and steward that. It doesn't end at they got a dollar, they spent a dollar. It has to be they got a dollar, they spent a dollar, and here's what we got for it, right? You have to roll that up into the the social contract and you know, without getting to fifty thousand foot here, you know, if you're taking a dollar away from somebody to enact a public program you have to demonstrate that that public program generates public benefits. And the way you do that is through performance measurement. Um, so I would not say that that's the case at all. Right. No, I, I guess my question, like, just to be a little bit more clear, so should we add another component just for performance measurement, just separate it out from the grant manager's responsibilities, have somebody else look at the performance measurement? I think ultimately it comes down to a resource question and uh, my experience over the last decade tells me that uh, at least with the state and local government grantees that I work with, and I'll ask you to chime in on that, uh, the resource constraints would say that is not uh, a, uh, an option with a lot of grantees just because they, they don't have the, the additional body to throw at it. I would also say that one of the things that kind of jumped out at us over time is that you have something of a split uh, personality out there with a number of, of grantees where on the one side you have some programmatic folks doing uh, the administration, doing the performance measurement work, and then with regard to your, your finances, there's a different office, you, it's a, the finance department, so there, you have somebody entering data who, and making drawdowns who does not necessarily understand the, uh, the other side of the ledger. And that creates a bit of confusion sometimes. So I, when I take the, the two of those observations and put them together, I'm thinking really it needs to be in one place, both, uh, you know, uh, both the financial and the programmatic uh, consideration in order to get the best outcome or the best reporting. Thank you. I would inject also, if you take a really concrete example that I think a lot of people are familiar with, you may say, well, let's spend less money on health care. But then you might say, well, that means we're going to stop spending money on preventive care and regular routine checkups through our public health clinics. The problem is that I think most people at this stage are aware enough of health economics to realize it's generally cheaper to do the preventive care and to avoid the kind of the emergency and the critical care later on down the line. So if you apply exclusively the financial perspective and say, you know what, I, I, the financial data is credible, it's audited, it's regularly and frequently available at a great level of detail, I can analyze it to death, 
and you don't ignore the kind of I mean, you ignore the kind of the health outcome on the the short term kind of uh, 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 issue of the preventive care versus the longer term issue of the critical care. That lack of focus on that program outcome and the extra focus on the financial outcome may produce a very bad result. Kathy. So maybe I better go over here, or should I come up here? Please, join. So uh, part of my academic focus has been on performance measurement um, for the last 30 years, and particularly following GPRA. But even more uh, more recently, we have uh, um, student groups uh, in that work with government and nonprofit agencies in our capstones uh, every year, many of them. One of them worked with a large grant program at HUD. I'm not going to say which one. Um, but uh, this this uh, this just this fall and I was very involved in that and one of the things I saw there that I've been seeing for years and years is that when you do say oh yeah measure some program outcomes as well um, but you also don't have a lot of expertise in that arena you get a lot of effort of measuring a whole bunch of things that uh, may not necessarily be easily attributable to the grant program. So for example, this, uh, if you just, uh, as they did, the HUD people said, we'd like to see your outcomes in a variety of you know, social, economic areas. But really, student um, graduation rates in high school and a whole bunch of other, I mean, Oh my gosh, we ended up coming up with, there were like uh, 380 different measures that the various grantees had come up with. Many of them just didn't even make sense. But it's like, well, we can measure that. That's available. Let's just, let's grant, you know. So I get really, I'm getting nervous when I hear people say, oh, we need to get out there and have some more performance measures that are more programmatic. We have to be careful because if you just say, yeah, measure. Um, you can get things that there's a lot more effort that's going to go into this because people aren't sure what are the best measures. Just tell me what are the best measures. You can't hey you can't Google that. It, that it's it's really hard and there's not a lot of good systematic shared knowledge that you could just say oh okay this will make this easy for you. These will be good programmatic issues. So I'm getting nervous hearing about the let's just measure more. Whenever I hear a consultant say just measure more and you're going to be better, uh, it, it makes me very nervous because just measuring more does not always mean better. And it's easier, fr frankly, to have agreed upon financial measures than it is to come up with agreed upon measures of effectiveness. Let me ask, um, the next topic is actually just exactly kind of what we're hitting on, which is the kind of the performance topic. And we have uh, some indication that folks in the grants management community, especially the nonprofits and the state and local said, our performance improved. So clearly someone is doing something about this. And so I thought we should ask, maybe starting with Jen, how do we, how did performance improve? You know, what are the factors behind this and are these things we can take advantage of, leverage, share, and learn about? Um, good question. So um, on the state level, you know, the agency is kind of very similar on the federal level. You have um, agencies kind of uh, have these programs and these measures in place and um, they're not necessarily the same as their sister agency. And we have that issue on the state level. Um, all the agency, you know, we don't have a consistent um, method of reporting performance or measuring performance and so um, one of I guess you know without putting everything on the federal government but considering that the the funds largely come from them to the state you know having some established metrics on the federal level to then be able to share and, and um, kind of uh, use on the state level as well would be very helpful um, in kind of making that consistent across the board. Um, but I know that, you know, on an individual level, there are many, many of our agencies who have, you know, strong um, grants leadership. Um, I could name a few, but I don't want to call anybody out specifically or make anyone else feel bad. But, um, you know, there are some significant efforts being had in kind of what the last question was about, you know, really understanding the program and the fiscal side. And those both are very important um, 
focus areas and often they function kind of in their own world but we, we're seeing in a lot of our agencies and offices now that you know they're they're getting together we're we're kind of rearranging where they're seated we're making sure that they're in proximity and trying to increase the collaboration so that these kind of interactions and um, communications are, are more easily had and they're sharing and they're um, they're kind of um, the, the tools and, and resources they have available we're communicating across all the agencies as a conduit for everybody that is uh, you know working on grants our office is helping facilitate that and so we've made some progress but it's it's not consistent because we kind of don't have a standard set of tools as well and it would be in our view helpful also you know to have some standard set maybe from some of these grantor agencies that we're receiving funds from that we can replicate and then the data would be more consistent Jen, did I just hear you say, hey, Stan and Ryan, can you all set <laughs> some performance measures? Maybe not a thousand, but maybe five. And then we'll try to get that information from our sub-recipients at the state level, from our counties or cities or special districts. Is that what I heard? It would be, an, it would be helpful. And I think our communities and our constituents would feel the same, um, you know, because a lot of the organizations who receive these funds as, you know, sub-recipients, they're smaller than we are. They have less resources than we have. And so creating these, just like you mentioned, um, about willy-nilly just coming up with performance metrics on their own, I mean, it's burdensome, It's incre but we, we need some standards, we need some ways of measurement, but it would be helpful to have like a starting point that we could share and that people consistently need for, pro I mean, some of this, not to throw you under the bus about you know some of your <laughs> Pearl HUD programs, but you know some of this stuff has like been around for ever. You know at this point, you know we we should probably be able to pull some metrics around what would be helpful. Um, some things are a little less. Um, uh, they they have maybe a, a shorter lifespan. You know some of these programs, but some are are pretty consistent and could probably you know. And I'd be happy to work with some of the federal agencies to kind of share what the states feel and come up with these, um, you know, help with these uh, measures. Stan and Ryan, what say you? <laughs> so for uh, the various forms of programs I'm responsible for, we've had a performance measurement framework in place since 2006. So now we've got 12, 13 years worth of data in there. And what it occurs to me based on uh, what we do with that data is there's you know, maybe somewhere between five and ten useful measures in there. Uh, that Out of how many total? A lot. Kathy's <laughs> 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 um, voice. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was it was done in a different environment, uh, but uh, uh, what we were really counting are outputs, not not outcomes. But the question is, what can you do with those outputs? And that's an effort that we've been trying to undertake uh, within the Community Development Block Grant Program over the last uh, last year or two, which is, it's almost like going to Home Depot or, or Lowe's in the interest of evil time there. But it's like you go there and, and there's the lumber aisle, raw material there. You can go to the hardware aisle, there's screws, nails, all kinds of things to put things together. Uh, you can make things out of that. So what we're doing is looking at the, this outcome data that we've got and trying to figure out well what can we do with what we've got already because we've got years worth of data and so we've been developing a, a collection of indicators on performance with regard to CBG that we can then begin to apply to our grantees across the board it gets also to our risk analysis process that we carry out every year and the, the, the point would be how can we better predict what's going to happen based on the information that we've got available to us uh, and so we hope to be able to roll that out later in the year for purposes of our risk analysis process. But again, you've got a lot of raw material already. Uh, let's make the best use of it rather than going out and trying to figure out uh, what is a new measure to collect. Frankly, there's been a lot of discussion within my grant 
grantee community, including the states, most particularly the states, about reducing what we collect under that performance measurement framework. We haven't gotten to the point of producing it yet, but clearly we know what are the important, important points of data that we're collecting over a long period of time. Brian, did you want to add or contrast? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about performance measurement at, at EDA. Um, part of it is that we have, a, we have a really varied portfolio of programs. Uh, EDA started as a public works, uh, public works type project with billions of dollars behind it in the, in the late 60s, and over time its portfolio has changed. It's, still driven primarily by public works and what we call economic adjustment assistance, which is you know, construction, construction based grants with one to one matching. That's kind of the bread and butter. But over time, we've, we've added things like regional innovation strategies, which is more focused on building capacity, human capacity, right? And so you can't look at all of those things in the same way. A construction grant is not the same as a technical assistance grant. It's not the same as a capacity building, human capacity building kind of award. And so we look at all of those things as building capacity. You're either building productive capacity or you're building human capacity. And the way that we've determined to do that is through the grant process, we've awarded research awards that have focused on how EDA's programs have changed over time. We're lucky, we, we get a one and a half million dollar research and evaluation appropriation in our annual budget. It's been consistently one and a half million dollars for about the last 10 or 20 years. Um, and what that allows us to do, not every federal program is as lucky, but what that allows us to do is it allows us to take a hard look at what our programs actually accomplish. And so we do that through rigorous economic analysis, and we use the data that we've collected. We've, uh, we've done some studies using third-party data, but building into our program and our decision-making apparatus for how we decide who is going to get competitive grant funding, we've taken a look at, we've developed a logic model, we've developed a, you know, these are the things that we can keep track of, these are the things that come out of this, and these are the desired program outcomes. And we're, we're lucky to have been able to do that. We've also made all of these things public. So if you go to eda.gov front slash performance, you can find the award data from the last several years worth of, um, of EDA funding awards. And you can find how we look at this analysis. So there's, um, there's a couple different ones that are out there right now. Um, and we continue to take a rigorous look at this from time to time over the course of things. Now, how does that trickle down to how someone who gets an award looks at their performance? We look at the aggregate performance. We'll always look at the aggregate performance. That's our role as the federal funder. But from an individual grant perspective, it's in the notice of funding opportunity that these are the things that we're looking for. These are the outcomes that we're looking for. You should be expected to track these outcomes. It's in the award announcements. These are what we're expecting, you know, these are the outcomes that we're expecting from this award. From the get-go, everyone is on the same page about what are the things that are important for showing the results of this program. Um, but you're right, there is, you know, whatever you can measure across a million dimensions, you're gonna measure and you're gonna look at, but you really have to distill what is going to actually be the driven program outcome, and there's some discretion in that. Let me ask a question to the folks in the audience. If you're, if you're a grant maker, raise your hand, please. How many of you are with a grant making organization? All right, if you are, keep, keep them up for just a minute. If your organization does what Ryan's EDA does, which is in your notice of award, you say what your expectations are, and I'm gonna go on a little bit and just make it up, and it says kind of, and here's how good we expect you to be. Does that appear in your notice of award? If so, keep your hand up. So I'm just roughly estimating, it looks like about half of grant makers do something similar to what Ryan's just described from EDA. So I find that, that quite interesting. That's kind of an example. But maybe that whole rose in the same agency. Ah, <laughs> it's a possibility. Ah. Okay, good. Good. Okay. So one of the things I'm hearing, though, that I'm seeing the data, and I'm also hearing a little bit that's interesting is the feds, much more often either can't say or don't know 
whether or not performance has improved in the last 12 months or gotten worse. State and locals and nonprofits, they say it's improved. More of them say it's not. And a majority say, you know what, we know and we can tell. So why is it, and is it okay, that the feds can't tell whether performance is improving or not, and state and locals can? What, what might explain that difference? Any ideas? Shelly? So I know one of the things that we're hearing a lot is, while uniform guidance is great, I guess, so to speak, I brought it all together, is that people don't know that an agency has their own exceptions and the agency themselves doesn't know, if I had start going, oh, <laughs> and the agency doesn't know that they have the exceptions. And when you're getting funding for the grantee who's getting funding from so many different sources, it's not the same. So that standardization that's there is yeah. not. Yeah. And when you're looking at your terms and conditions, people don't read it anyway. As, you know, they need that call at the beginning that says, all right, this is what we're expecting from you and this is what our agency does. But when you're getting money from 10 different sources, it's not. Yeah. Let me offer one other hypothesis. I'm sorry, go ahead. Hmm? I actually, I'm very impressed with the management concept, so I teach a lot, I don't personally teach, but I have a lot of instructors who teach about this. One thing that I've noticed over the years, do you feel, or people in the audience feel, that sometimes you're being forced to put an outcome on a program that just really needs an output in terms of its policy goals as stated in the legislation for financial assistance. I'm gonna recognize people are here individually and not representing the... <laughs> <laughs> my, my sense is no. Uh, because uh, we are, for the most part, uh, staying we're, we're trying not to change it from year to year. Um, we, there's a certain constraint system-wise that uh, if you want to collect something that, that we don't already have uh, sort of embedded in our data and financial system, then you, you have to go outside of that and now you're pulling in some alternative approach, be it collect, you know, collecting it uh, uh, from grantees via, you know, like, uh, an Excel submission or something of that nature that could be problematic, uh, particularly given OMB restrictions on, on that, that sort of data collection. So we, we the system in some level constrains us from doing that. And it's not that the uh, under the formula programs, it, it, it varies all that much from year to year to year. Your eligible activities stay the same. Uh, national objective uh, outcomes for these programs stay the same. So you're not seeing a lot of variation in the formula programs themselves, so I don't I don't run uh, competitive programs, so it, things tend to stay in the same lane. Uh, just as I, I stated at the beginning, our our, our upfront requirements uh, tend not to change, nor do you know, a lot of uh, reporting and outcome requirements. They they just they stay very very consistent over a long period of time. I, I want to clarify my question. Not, not so much because I agree with you in terms of consistency. That's really important and an advantage. But sometimes I feel like we're moving towards every program needs to have an outcome where sometimes people may just need to get butts and seats to a training and they need to train so many people over a year, over time. And there's an, a, there's an expectation that there's supposed to be a broader social outcome when really you're just continuing to provide housing that is safe and clean and affordable, and you're not necessarily having a broader highfalutin social impact that has a whole bunch of other data coming into it. So I think, th is that something that people feel is a problem and maybe a challenge as we try to uniform, unify performance outcomes? So again, much of our performance measurement framework, I think on a certain level is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, it's uh, it, it's really collecting you know outcomes uh, uh, or, or outputs as opposed to outcomes, and uh, it, it's not providing any sort of synthesis. It's 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 on us to do an analysis of what we have in, in hand, and again, that's why we've been trying to figure out over the last year or two how can we make better use of the data that we're already collecting, in in order to give us a better picture of what is going on with our grantees. 
Let me uh, pose a hypothesis that I'd like you all to try and shoot down. The hypothesis is, and this is going to be skeptical intentionally, just to kind of provoke your response, federal agencies gather performance information for two reasons. One is to make sure that they can appropriately manage risk, and avoid giving grant money to places where it's going to be wasted or, or misused or not have impact. And secondly, to be able to figure out who should get the grant to make selections. And that kind of those are the two prominent reasons that feds actually gather performance information and that that disappoints grant recipients because what grant recipients really want to know is who's doing a great job that I can learn from. But the feds don't kind of as consistently provide a detailed granular picture of those performance outcomes back to the folks who are reporting them in. And therefore, the locals and the states can never actually get that purpose they want. And so the state and local governments don't really care so much about the performance that they report to the feds, because they never really see it except when they get an award or not, or except when their hands are slapped. So is that hypothesis accurate, or is it inaccurate? I think it's more of the <laughs> this is, Yeah, this definitely speaks to the competitive world. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's uh, relatively accurate. I also think it's incomplete. The, um, you know, one of the reasons that we would tell you flat out, we don't really look at individual grant performance at the aggregate level is because we don't do a lot of repeat business. Um, if we build a bridge in a place, the bridge is built. Yeah. Um, we hope not to build that bridge again. Um, and so if you're good at building bridges, you still have a value of one. So you built one bridge. And so you know, for us, it's not about performance improving over time. It's it really is out. It's really outcome driven, but that's the nature of the kinds of awards that we make. And so we're less concerned about improved performance over time. However, if you're a recipient, you want to demonstrate that you're improving your performance over time because that's how you find more resources to do more things to enact those outcomes that you're trying to pursue. Yeah. What about? Jen, from a state perspective, does that hypothesis seem accurate to you or not? Uh, basically, yeah. I mean, I feel very similarly to um, what was just mentioned. And um, I think that um, the state, so the agencies, the agencies kind of manage that effort on their own. And I think that, you, you know, you would find that um, those things the compliance and the reporting and the performance measures and increasing performance is obviously important. And we need to show that as the, oftentimes as the sub-recipient from the federal government, we need to then articulate that back up. So it's, it's especially important to our agencies to kind of get that feedback from our sub-recipients, from the community and the constituents so that we can kind of manage expectations and relay that information up to the federal government as well so that we can keep those funds coming into the state. Can you introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Alton King. I'm at uh, DOJ. <laughs> um, I think the culture of an agency really impacts how they approach performance. I spent time at HHS, at SAMHSA, and CDC, and there the culture of performance, it, public health almost necessitates the use of data in so many different ways that contrast to where I'm at at DOJ and the criminal justice, data is like, mm, there's a lot of discomfort on what gets collected and how to then think about outcomes because outcomes is something that you directly do not have control over and because uh, I have spent several years in HIV I can definitely understand from the states that if you get funding from CDC, HRSA, SAMHSA you have three different systems but there's the client level data collection that happens but states more often than not understand that well, they have all this richness of data that they can then use to apply at HUD through HOPWA program or some other agency. At DOJ, people don't see, or from my perspective, value the potential of data of how 
grantees can really use it to not just better their program, but also to get additional funding from other federal agencies that can actually enable them to do some of the things that they need for help reduce recidivism, that maybe there's something that USDA can provide that DOJ cannot because it's constrained through its authorization. Let me ask a, for an interplay for a moment between Stan and Ryan. So I mean, the, the general question is going to be, and, and let's just actually ask this whole room, how many of your federal agencies or state or local agencies consider performance measures from data gathered outside your own agency? Anybody? Rely on performance data from another source. So then let me turn it into a specific question again between kind of uh, uh, Stan and Ryan. And so the question is, Stan is interested presumably in some sort of housing outcomes. And those may include things that are not gathered necessarily by HUD. But you know what? I'll bet the Census Bureau gathers some things on kind of percent homeless or you know, transitions in housing. And so my question is, is this happening where there are metrics that are used by HUD to evaluate its grant programs, but where the data comes from some other source, in this case, a fellow federal agency? Is, is that happening? Is that rare? So for, again, from the formula program perspective, we use uh, American Community Survey data from, uh, from census. Uh, on an annual basis to revise and update our allocation formulas. I mean, we're directed by statute to use uh, the, the most current available data from uh -huh. census. So in that context, we do use it. But as far as uh, any funding, any other sort of funding decision, because the formula is already baked, we don't really have a lot of discretion there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, certainly a grantee can use that information. We expect them to use that information to develop it plan for the use of the dollars when they explain to us exactly what their plan is for the coming year for the various formula dollars that are coming in their direction. Uh, I would say the department collects a lot of data with respect to uh, uh, homeless populations, uh, but it does that through a separate uh, data collection process uh, under the auspices of our special needs programs. Sure. Um, and that actually is, a, I think, a, a uh, a fairly distinct and unique data set that, that, is, that is maintained sure. and, and collected by the department. And I have one last question. This is for you, Shelley, on this topic, which is, in theory, lots of different grantees are very proud of their programs. And they'll say, this is a best practice. It's been working really well. But in fact, given what may be a little bit of a kind of a gap in some outcome performance measures, it may be really hard to say, you know what, actually, the agency in that state's doing a great job, and the agency in this state thinks they're doing a great job, but they're not. And so my question is, Shelley, how is it that we currently, or how could we be doing kind of figuring out who really has the best practice and sharing it? Is, is, are things at the place you'd like them to be to be able to say, you know what, we're the National Grants Management Association, and we know that this really is a best practice. Are you satisfied with where things are at, or would you like to see something change, do you think? Eh, a little of both. I think um, a lot of that falls into what people don't know. I think a lot of the people receiving funding are a lot smaller organizations than what the feds realize, and that's what we've come to find over the past few years is they're really thinking big picture and they're thinking these big universities where there's a lot of these small nonprofits in these small local cities who are getting the funding, and they're one people shows, and they didn't go to school for grants management, and they don't have a person sitting next to them to ask, how do I do this in NGMA? We take what we're given to put it out there. One of the things we actually learned this year is information we put out, information the feds are putting out, is very high level. And where you're looking at that chart earlier where it said so many new people are coming into grants, we're not putting it into layman's terms that they understand. And they don't know what they're being asked. They don't know what information they're supposed to be giving and some are giving too much information some don't give enough so don't they don't read it and so they give what they think they're supposed to give so i think the more we can give them the more simplified we can give it to them the more that we actually put out there and don't expect them to research to find out how to do it's going to help everybody on both sides in the long run 
So let me conclude on the, 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 the performance topic by mentioning one last thing. Uh, this again is a slight minor plug, which is that uh, the Bureau of the Census actually sponsors something called the Opportunity Project, where private firms are invited to come in and give a demonstration against a particular challenge. They set up five challenges each year, and my company, along with one other, are putting out a demonstration. It's going to be available and open to the public this Friday at a Census Bureau location I can share with you. And essentially what we did for the challenge was we tried to mash up from public sources, financial disbursement information from grant making agencies. We chose three in particular. One was HRSA, Health Resources and Services Administration, one was FEMA, one was Department of Ed for an individual grant program at each. And to prepare, prepare and provide on a publicly accessible website their financial disbursements and their performance data. Again, from publicly accessible sources. Now, do they mash up neatly in every case? Not necessarily. But it provides, I think, a really interesting opportunity. And again, uh, we'll share with you the, the, the URL for the website, but also there's, again, an opportunity, I think it's in Suitland, Maryland, at a Census Bureau office this Friday, for those who are interested, an opportunity to come and see our demo, a demo from a competitor, and then demos on, I think, four other topics as well. It's kind of just addressing this in particular. Um, but let's move on. One of the topics that um, uh, we kind of talked about during the survey analysis was burden. And in fact, this is something that is of, a, of, of concern to the administration. And so my question, and this one's going to start with kind of Jen and with Shelley, what can be done about reducing burden uh, around grant management? What suggestions might you make that you would say are kind of the high priority opportunities? Um, let's see. I would go back to what I kind of said earlier about making sure it's that they're getting the information that they need and more hand holding at the beginning than saying we'll come back to you in a couple months to get this information. So some advance notice, a little bit of hand holding, especially for new grant recipients and in cases even where it's an experienced grant recipient, if they've got some new staff offering them a little bit more assistance and advice and hand holding. Absolutely even for the experience. Jen, any yeah, I agree as, as well. And I think, um, you know, you, you might find that you're doing a little less hand-holding um, and providing support if we had some consistent um, metrics in place that I think would reduce the burden. We wouldn't have to be recreating the wheel <coughs> with all these things or agencies across, you know, the whole federal government or the whole state in my case aren't recreating the wheel every time, you know, one of these situate, you know, every time we're uh, posting a grant opportunity or I connecting think, with the community. Sorry, sorry. when you say recreating uh -huh. the wheel, some of what we hear, and we hear it a lot, is when they call a Fed agency, they're talking to a different person every time and nobody knows their story and mm. they lose that connection of, it's kind of calling mm. the help desk, uh, yeah. just for, a, it's a help desk and they transfer you 10 times and you have to keep repeating your story is yeah. they can't get to the right person who can help them and they're not always given the right information. So maybe having a named kind of account representative or alternatively having the grantors have a customer relationship management system where there are kind of some detailed notes about each interaction with this particular grant recipient so that even if it's a different person that addresses it next time, they've kind of got the information right in front of them. Okay, um, let's move on. Sorry. Question. Question. Actually, I just wanted to make a comment, follow up on Shelley's. Um, mm -hmm. I have worked as a Can you grant. Oh, I'm Denisa. I'm a grants manager for the National uh, Governors Association. It's a small nonprofit organization in D.C. We do a lot of work with uh, the states. I know Jennifer, and so. Um, I've also worked for the National Science Foundation as a Grants and Agreements Officer for two years. So I've seen both sides. And I can tell you what is burdensome now on the recipient side is, and I've worked for a federal agency, so <coughs> sometimes it's challenging for me as well. For example, dealing with CDC, HRSA. The problem is, you know, each agency has their own structure, their own sort of rules, yes, you can follow the uniform guidance, I agree with Shelley, but sometimes it's very um, ambiguous. It's kind of left, uh, each guidance is left open to interpretation. Take cost transfers, for example, it, you know, the uniform guidance states something like, it should be processed in a timely manner. Well, what is that exactly? You know, if you get a side visit by an agency, they will say, oh, well, you should do it, you know, within 90 days, but that's not really stated. So that's just one example. So I think that's what burdensome is the fact that you have to learn 
to and understand how each agency operates, how each funding uh, vehicle is like structured, and mm -hmm. what the guidance is for that. So that part is burdensome because you need a lot of resources. You need people to actually yeah. manage the grants properly. So when you're working for a small organization, a nonprofit, you wear many hats. So that sometimes can sure. be. So that was, now on the grants officer side, when I was working for the federal agency, what was a bit more burdensome there was just making sure when you're processing the proposals, all the, uh, find that the administrative requirements are there, like the, all the different components, the budgets are uh, developed correctly, indirect rates applied correctly, and stuff like that. So I just wanted to give my two cents. <laughs> Let me ask uh, for anybody in the room, if there were some entity, presumably part of the federal government, that you would point to and say, we would like them to help coordinate across federal departments that make grants, what entity might you point to? I want to say you would have to say HHS because they give out by far the most money. Of the $600 billion, they probably give out about so 400 So you point to the gorilla, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not gorilla, of whom there are some representatives in the room, and I won't call any particular names, but I wonder if any of the representatives of HHS would like to respond, or would HHS be the right place, or do the folks who represent HHS not want to respond? Uh, well, I'll also qualify, because I also worked in HHS. Uh, uh, of those operating divisions, I would probably choose CDC over huh. others. I mean, they're certainly not perfect, but I think it depends on which center you're dealing with. So if it's the HIV team, I think they're pretty good. I mean, you have to like drill down to a specific part because yes, HHS is very massive. How NIH does things is very different from FDA. Uh -huh. Which is different from CDC and HRSA and SAMHSA and CMS and everyone else. Any, anybody else have a response either from HHS or otherwise? I, I mean, I have a response only just to, to kind of, I, I kind of agree and then I don't agree at the same time. And the reason I'm saying it like that is because we have so many different agencies that do different things. And within those agencies, you have all these different departments. So it's very difficult to try to streamline a process when you have basically 500 different small departments and all the federal agencies as a whole. So if we're not going to be in a situation where all the agencies come together, create one like collaborative group to kind of work through all of this foolishness in order to get one common goal for the whole entire government, and then that's the platform that everybody is going to follow, I think we're going to keep chasing our tails around like a dog to come up with a solution that's impossible to win. So I, I, all, I rarely ask a question which I don't at least have an idea of an answer, and I'll see whether or not a representative who may formerly have been with OMB has any perspective, and she will know who I'm speaking of, whether or not she would like to say anything. Um, you know, my thought was, well, the place that would make sense is the OMB Office of Federal Financial Management, which has a group of four or five folks who focus on grants and grants policy. And so my thought would be that would be kind of the point where you would at least kind of have the instigation and perhaps, again, some sort of cross-agency group that might say, all right, what are the kind of three or four highest priority areas where we should coordinate in order to reduce burden? So there's kind of my hypothesis. Would anybody like to shoot that down? Nobody from HHS, no former OMB person wants to shoot the hypothesis. All right then. Okay, um, so the next topic... Sorry. Uh, so the next topic is there's an interest in sharing data and having some sort of um, uh, electronic systems to do that. Would any of the panelists like to say, you know, how, how should this happen? Should the feds provide the systems? Should there be a you know, kind of a joint procurement by GSA? Is there some other way for this to happen that will help kind of all parties make happen what clearly is strongly of interest, which is better automated interactions and data sharing between the federal and the state locals? How should this happen? It should happen. It won't happen. <laughs> Jen says. We agree. I mean, we feel like it should start at the top. I mean, it would help us, again, if we're scrambling on the state level to kind of figure this out and it affects our constituents and our subrecipients, it still leaves this gap between our primary funder, which is the federal government. And so it would be extremely helpful to us if you know, 
um, the federal government would take a lead on a platform um, to kind of collect or share this kind of data and information, even if it's, um, you know, if, even if it starts out like as a research and data collection, like a database so that folks can kind of use existing information or be able to collaborate on um, proposals or um, questionnaire. I mean, there's a lot of data that's collected, a lot of information that's needed. And, you know, if we had a place to even store it and be able to access it, that would even be helpful. But I think it has to come from the federal government to, to be effective. Let me ask, uh, being familiar a little bit with General Services Administration, who is one of REI Systems' clients, they do something with their acquisition process, let's call it the uh, one of their uh, multiple award schedules that they use to buy stuff, and then they allow any federal agency that wants to, to, to kind of piggyback and use that schedule, and they charge a fee. Uh, they charge somewhere between a quarter and three quarters of a point, depending on what it is. So however much your agency spends, let's say you spend a million on something, you have to pay 25000 75000 or so, in order to kind of defray the costs of GSA establishing that schedule, vetting the vendors, managing, administering it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, would it make sense for something similar to happen with respect to such a system for grants? And would it make sense, do you think, more so to say, well, let's have it be a kind of a government-wide sort of entity like GSA, or would it be a place where you could say, as, as Alton did, hey, you know what, HHS is the big dog, why not let them do it? And, and you know, I, I guess, again, I guess there's my hypothesis. Please shoot at it. Would that make sense? Would that not make sense? So um, there have been multiple initiatives over many years to kind of move us towards uh, whatever your terminology would be, you know, center of excellence with regard to grants administration. Uh, current push is, is on again with this administration. I mean, we've seen it in, in, in past years. Uh, the question is, you know, ultimately, will there be uh, the the force put behind it to make it happen. Uh, and uh, every administration has a bit of a different approach and a different take on this. And uh, you know, we haven't achieved it yet, but uh, certainly efforts being made again uh, at this point in time to, to move us in a more common direction. But as far as just using a, a, a GSA uh, schedule approach, that that's not one that I'm, I'm, I'm terribly familiar with at this point for uh, for purposes of a common system. So forgive me for pushing back a moment, but it seems to me as if there's an existing kind of entity, let's call it Grant Solutions, which is run by HHS Administration for Children and Families, and it does create kind of a shared capability to deal with grants management. And forgive me if this is not correct, but I believe it is correct, which is that is almost entirely for the benefit of federal agencies, to make it easier for them to do the kind of the grantor side of the work, and it does not provide any substantial kind of capability to the state or the local the grant recipients to share data back and forth easily. Is that wrong? Uh, I had right. some... That's... I'm sorry? That's right. That's right. Okay, so what, what, what I think I'm suggesting is there exists something to kind of make life easier and share capabilities at the federal level, but nothing that kind of shares capabilities between levels of government. And so again, it, it strikes me that there's a major gap here that's being called for by the survey respondents. We want better ways to share data back and forth between feds and grant recipients, primarily at the state level, but perhaps deeper as well. It doesn't exist, and what I hear, it's very plausible, as Jen saying and Shelley saying, feds need to take the lead. So this is a hint, in my mind, to a certain extent, it could be for GSA, it could be for OMB's Office of Federal Financial Management, it could be for HHS, could be that any agency would want to step up and say, hey, I'll do that, and maybe if you've got kind of a working capital fund and the ability to recover the revenue, some agencies do, some don't, you could say, you know what, I'm gonna create this, I'm gonna be an entrepreneur because there's a clear need for this. Does anybody think that that's a stupid idea, doesn't make any sense? Does anybody want to step up here today and say, I'll do it? <laughs> okay. I, there, is a structural, there is a structural problem with the way that federal agencies can ask for information, right? 
we're not, you know, because of the requirements of a Board Production Act, we can't ask you how you feel about our grant system without having an <laughs> OMB form to do that. Yes. And so, you know, I would push back on you guys a little bit. You know, if you're hearing this from your membership, if you're hearing this from other states, you need to collect that information and you need to build that case because we will not be able to. Um, so I, I hear what you're saying and I think it's important and I do think that that interoperability is important and I do think having a uniform feel is important and could make things better, could shorten learning curves, could do a lot of things. There's a big efficiency to be gained there, but you're not going to hear that case come from us. So this survey is kind of identifying problems and issues and how strongly people tend to think about it. Let me make an offer right now as to kind of thinking about solving it. Let's take, for example, Shelley's conference for the National Grants Managers Association annual conferences in, in April, I think it is. I would be willing to stand up and facilitate a focus group that the federal government doesn't have to worry about the Paperwork Reduction Act limitations on, and we can invite 10 states, 20 states, representatives from local governments to come in and say, you know, first, maybe, what do you think of the top three or four grant systems that exist? Second, you know, what would you want to exist in terms of kind of the shared need? And I would be happy to accept input from federal agencies and representatives such as yourself, Ryan, into what kind of questions you would like to have the feedback on and the answers to. And then we could run a focus group. And again, you could sit and listen. You could send some colleagues to sit and listen. Folks from other agencies could come and listen if, if this is something that is of strong interest to kind of help get over that hurdle that I know you do experience. I'll one up it. Mm -hmm. All right. We're so actually, let's do it. We're yes. <laughs> and again, would you please identify yourself? Oh, sure, oh. sure, Londa Bloom. Um, it doesn't seem apparent to me, though, that the, the issue um, surround um, grantee supported systems is something that is not desired from the federal standpoint. Of course, it's my own opinion. Um, I, I think that it's more cost driven for um to get those systems in a way yes. where they um not not only support the, the federal agency agenda but also are interactive for the grantees i think it's, it's more cost driven because you have to think about where's the money going to come from to get that system that way and then you you probably <coughs> have to consider taking away the money taking away some of the money for the valuable program outcomes that you expect to get to be able to support and pay for the system yeah so. And, and that's interesting because this, this slide says from the survey's response, people at the state and local level like their access to technology, although there are clearly some disappointments. Federal level, not as happy, frankly, as the state and locals are. State and locals' biggest gripe is exactly what you're saying, which is the cost. And so then it may be time to think about, well, what are some new financial mechanisms? And again, one of my suggestions is do kind of like what GSA does. You know, the presumption is we're spending more than a trillion dollars a year in grants from the federal government. And we are, I'm sorry, it's not more than a trillion, it's like 700 billion, something like that. Anyway, but if, even if we said, all right, well, let's take half of a percent or 1% of that away from the grants and use it to make the thing more efficient, where would you put that money? It seems clear from the survey that some of it is gonna be technology that allows for easier sharing of data back and forth between the levels of government. And so the question may be, you know, maybe this takes executive order, maybe it takes congressional action, but it seems to me like there's clear demand for it on both sides, the federal as well as the state and local grant recipient, but hasn't happened yet. So this may be a topic for the advocacy that uh, uh, was being suggested that needs to take place by advocates as opposed to kind of federal representatives, perhaps. So I would like to actually give, so I think that, that actually goes back to some of the statutory requirements. The statutory requirements are actually going to drive technology requirements in what agencies have to do and have to collect. And I think that what gets lost is that we do have a federal system of government. It's designed to be inefficient to do certain things. And if you want more synergy, you do have to go back to Congress and to change some of those underlying statutory requirements. And there's going to be a lot of hesitation to implement any of that change because we're not going to do that. And I would also say that there's a certain point where you don't want to have all the data together. There are some programs that are meant to provide risk and are going to collect information and it's going to be an agency's culture validly that they don't want to share too much information because it's going to create privacy and classification issues. And also for GSA, how many of you are federal contractors and you've been asked for past performance even though you're not supposed to be done because it's on a GSA schedule? So I think that there's just a lot of cultural issues you're going to have to get over. 
So these are good points, but I just have to have a mildly snarky aside. This is one of the rare occasions where I've heard the private sector coming up with kind of reasons to go cautiously and be careful, whereas the folks from the government seem to be a little more interested in leaning forward. I, I find that to be the opposite of what often seems to happen. Okay, let's go back. We skipped a couple of things here. Um, and we touched on this briefly, but there's some interest. These, again, are the types of things where people said, you know, what do you feel most strongly about? What do you feel least strongly about? Some of the things that people felt most strongly about was uh, that, that they were most concerned about was they didn't have a good way to determine what best practices are and how to share lessons learned uh, and or, you know, have the right sort of information to evaluate and select grantees. And so my question here is, uh, again, kind of maybe from both sides, from the federal, uh, from for what I understand, or from the, the, the state, from Jen, you know, what would you say, what can be done about this to kind of better determine best practices in a way that's kind of rigorous, and then that allows them to be shared with people who are new to the field because they just joined the grants management field a year ago or six months ago? What would you suggest? Uh, well, I would just say that, you know, our office is, um, has some efforts in place to kind of collect and uh, communicate certain tools and resources that might be helpful across all the, you know the grant managers and all the agencies so you know we're, we're a small office of two and so we support the whole entire state and um, you know as mentioned in some of the survey um, training and kind of experience in some of these grant managers and people that are managing the day-to-day -day operations in, um, on a grant that might, it varies from agency to agency and program to program and so we've recognized this as a, a challenge for some of our agencies and we do a lot of, um, you know, engagement with our points of contact within the agencies and sharing um, experiences and tools and resources to help kind of help those new new folks along or share um, best practices internally um, so I mean we don't have necessarily a um, platform that is kind of public but we we have internally created a mechanism for um, data sharing and um, tools and information research, resources sharing internally. But again, I think it goes to, you know, um, a, a grants management system kind of mechanism on a, on a bigger scale would naturally lend to collecting some of this information and being, and being a good place to share some of these documents or resources. May I ask, Jen, you say we have a platform, and that makes me think of, well, is it a, a phone tree or an annual conference or a, an email list? We have several kind of mechanisms, yeah. So we have, um, the state uses Gmail, um, Google platform, we use the drive, and you know, you can manage access to information that's provided there, and then um, we gather our points of contact in each of the agencies very, on a frequent basis to kind of train and inform and share um, experiences across the state mm -hmm. um, so and then you know we have our annual conference that is um, usually in the fall that um, we've had you know 600 plus people attend and it's a good place to share and learn and kind of go through some of this training as well okay. Ryan or Stan do you want to offer any thoughts about how, uh, how to better share best practices and really effective results um, one of the things that we do is we actually have specific awards that are geared toward technical assistance. So if there's a specific kind of award, say, you know, revolving loan funds or a specific kind of community that we're really trying to work with to improve their reporting or their performance or managing their performance or performance reporting, um, we would try to identify those and then we would try to find somebody that could be a TA provider that would help them. Again, we're fairly restricted in how we can interact with groups of communities, and so um, we tend to rely on associations or membership groups or um, individual individuals who have access to those certain kinds of communities. And I heard you say award, and I'm thinking you meant an award of grant funding, or did you mean an award like a gold star at a boy? Uh, award as in funding, yeah, yeah. 
I mean, attaboys are great, but. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wouldn't discount the power of attaboy. We actually, uh, uh, two weeks ago, we ran a, uh, the annual uh, campaign, or the annual event in REI where we give an award to the team amongst, you know, 30 or 40 different teams in REI that made the most impact. And actually one that was supporting Utah State Board of Education with a grant system got the award. And in part, it was because they could show the significance of the impact on the students in Utah. But in part, it was also because they said, you know, the average grant management system for a state costs between 3 and 4% of the grant funding. And the one that was implemented in Utah was done for one quarter of 1%. So it was somewhere in the neighborhood of like 1 12th to 1 16th the price. Uh, and, and so that was kind of the impact that they made. But what, what is interesting about that, and I'm curious, again, as to whether or not it happens is, do you offer an award, let's, let's start with you, Ryan, do you offer an award to grantees to say, here's the very best, or the five best, and these are really the exemplars to any other grantee in the country who wants to learn from the best? Do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> is there any reason you could not, if you wanted to? Uh, you know, I think it's time. You know, so it's I, just I think, a question. I think it's time, yeah. Okay. Stan, I'm sorry, you were going to say? Well, we, we've done that off and on over the years. Uh, Offer awards? Uh, no, but recognition. Okay, gold yeah. star sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, again, depending on the attention of uh, uh, the senior management, you know, we'll roll these things out and, yeah. or, or, or kind of uh, pause them. Uh, but uh, with regard to a, a constant ongoing effort, we try to collect the, uh, from our grantees best practices and exemplary projects. Uh, I got to tell you, sometimes it's difficult to get them to give us a, that information. We have a portal on our website that mm -hmm. says, you know, here it is, give it your best. It is uh, like pulling teeth sometimes to get them to submit to this. Uh, every, now, time I, every time I go out to an interest group meeting, I'm like, please, please fill the bucket. And, and responses tend to be minimal. So we want them to give that to us. We're going to vet it. We're going to check it out. Does yeah, it meet yeah. all the requirements? And then we'll, we'll post it in a, a uniform format so that uh, uh, you know, when the public looks at it, 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 it makes some sense and that they're, they're, uh, they're uniform across the board. But uh, sometimes it's just difficult to get the grantee to give you that information. Concurrently, with regard to um, best practices, we use our TA funding. We can collect that information by using our TA providers mm -hmm. uh, in order to provide that benefit to the uh, grantee community as a whole. So there are a couple different ways to do it, but you got to have some some cooperation out there sure. at the state and local level that they want to put these projects out there as an example. Do you ever, um, since I actually ran this program within REI to kind of identify the, the best impact, do you ever say, you know, I looked through the data and I found that of a thousand different grant recipients, you know, you 10 or 15 or 20 are amongst the best. I think you ought to be submitting a nomination for yourselves to be one of the, named one of the top five. Do you ever kind of go and kind of, uh, you know, pigeonhole someone and say, why aren't you submitting? You might win. Uh, at my level, probably not, uh, but our field staff does. Okay. I mean, we have 43 okay. field offices around the country with the, with the uh, staff at, at sure. who are the primary contact with the grantees on a day in, day out sure. basis. I would certainly have them, they who know the grantees best to make, you know, provide that sort of encouragement. Sure. If I can put out, yeah. like, oh, go ahead. I guess I, I guess I have a comment as well. I think that one of the issues that you may have in not receiving that information is just based on the timing and all the work that goes into continuously uh, managing other rewards. I think that also that the information that you potentially want as an actual recipient of grant funding, I, I feel that you should have that information based upon me reporting back to you with the information that you have requested of me inside of the award. And so I don't think that after I do what I'm supposed to do, I give you my reporting, whether you make me report yearly, um, quarterly, or even sometimes we have bi-weekly reports and all these things that other individuals require us in the program, that I then, once the award is over with and I've given you my final report, I'm now going to have to go back and kind of fill out these things to help you come up with some other things. I think that those things should be pulled out of the actual reports that we're sending back. Then that way that helps you foster where to go next. And I did not introduce myself. I'm Troy Drew Hargrove from American Society for Engineering Education. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, sorry. Um, Jerry Ashworth with uh, Thompson Information Services. Can you? Provide any extra information on the second uh, 
chart there, the, the second one. This one? Yes, it's, it's the, the confidence has gone down over the years and it specifically went down last year. Was there anything that happened last year that make it, make, made it drop? So, fortunately or unfortunately, we just gather the data. We invite the panelists to come and help offer an interpretation. My question is, panelists, any thoughts about why it is people's confidence in their ability to meet mission has slipped just a little? And, and keep in mind, it hasn't slipped by half. It's slipped by, uh, you know, maybe, what is it, a quarter of a point on the five-point scale. This is just blown up so people can see the difference. Any <laughs> so it's, it's, not, it's not as catastrophic as it might seem. Yeah, I had that mark as visual distortion. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so any, any thoughts on why people might have slipped a little bit in their confidence and ability to meet mission? I think when you question confidence, a lot's come out over the past year. And you just hear these words as to, is the data act going to come through? Is the great act coming through? Is the gone act? And what does that mean? And how is that going to impact me? And what do I have to do with it? And it's the uniform guidance is changing this year and everyone's in this hoopla about it and so it it's not a it's the opposite you know it makes you start questioning and yeah. now one of the things i thought in trying to kind of reconcile some of the internal pieces was well maybe it's because there are some more junior folks coming into the field and they're just not as sure as the the kind of more senior folks who may have retired sorry uh, just a uh, thought so from the panel can you me. identify yourself jory heckman with federal news network uh, just some thoughts from the panel on, um, it's been mentioned a couple times now, but um, if the GREAT Act does pass, and if, you know, thoughts on what what impact it might have on particularly the, the quality of the data and uh, the ability to meet mission as we're seeing on the slide here. My personal, my personal thought is that I, I think that uh, there's going to be some hiccups. Right. Um, any transition like that is going to uh, is is going to have some hiccups. It's going to have some problems that go along with that change. But if there's a discussion around it, I think that's constructive, and I think that's constructive for the federal agencies, and I think that that's constructive for the grantees. Um, I think the one thing that you'll hear from all four of us is that the current situation is fairly untenable um, and is not sustainable, and so. Figuring out how we move forward is harder to get agreement on, um, but I think the start of the conversation is a good thing and is a constructive thing. And I think if people go into it with goodwill and with their eyes open, we'll find some some ways that we can do this better. Plenty of low hanging fruit out there. Mm -hmm. And on the uh, kind of sharing best practices topic, Shelley, I was thinking you were going to offer a plug for some of the capabilities that you and NGMA mm -hmm. offer. That's did you want to offer such a plug? I did without it, making it into a plug. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Maybe it's not a plug. Maybe it's just information. There's a lot of associations that we do what we do, but we are the only association that's full life cycle on both sides of a federal fund. So we support the grantors and we support the grantees. Um, we have a social community that's actually so highly used that out of the platform vendor, they said out of any one of their clients, we are the most used platform. And it's a way, it's a safe zone. It's a safe zone where our members are posting these questions that they're afraid to ask the feds and they look to see if somebody else has examples and it's a place where they can post these questions and they have a library of templates but they feel safe where they can ask these questions and they think that no one else is watching them but someone else is responding and giving them that answer and when you were talking earlier about this opportunity to talk with the feds we are doing an annual conference in April but for the first time we're putting out what we call a federal foyer and it's an opportunity to meet with the feds one-on-one -on -one and ask them those questions. I get calls every day saying a fed won't return my call. And somehow if somebody writes me with what their situation is and I call that agency, I can get the response, but they can't. And everyone's busy and there's so many people. So we just try to become that forum of the middleman to find out what's going on with the feds and give you that information but give you a forum to um, respond to it. She's got something Great. in the back. And we have a question from an online uh, live stream participant. Do you want to read it? Sure. Uh, it's actually relevant to this. Um, this is from Lori Beeler um, from Illinois government. She just wants everyone to know that Carol Krauss in Illinois, or Illinois heads up the state grants lead group to share best practices among state grant officers. And any states interested in participating can email Carol at Carol, C-A-R-O-L, dot Kraus, K-R-A-U-S, at Illinois.gov. Great. 
So there are networks in a variety of places. Let me ask Shelley, uh, just as a, a, a point of uh, uh, information, if a federal agency who were concerned they couldn't gather information from more than nine different grant recipients because of uh, uh, Paperwork Production Act, and let's let's pretend their name were Sam, not not Ryan, but their name were Sam, could they post that question on your bulletin board, and would they be likely to get responses from a number of different grant recipients? I'd say yes, they can post it on the bulletin board, but if it's a big enough group that you're trying to get feedback from, I can personally send out a survey and collect those responses for you. So it becomes on behalf of NGMA to sure. get those stakeholder and, and feedback. One other thing on, on the same topic on behalf of both uh, Kathy Neuheimer, the Trachtenberg School, uh, Shelley, uh, NGMA, and myself on REI Systems, if you say, hey, there's a topic I really want to learn about systematically from across the grants community, can you please include a question like this on next year's survey? We would be very happy to have your input. We try and make sure there's a pretty good consistency in the survey from year to year so that it's kind of comparable and we can find trends, but we don't hesitate to add new questions where they seem important and especially where there's strong interest. So let's move on. We've got about 20 minutes left, uh, and I do also want to make sure that the, the folks who have questions in the audience have a chance to ask them. Uh, the next topic I was going to ask about is um, actually the one we were kind of just on, which is are there good, this is there's questions about kind of grant making and from a federal perspective. So the question is, how can federal grant managers and grantors get feedback on their programs? And again, you've heard some of the concerns about Paperwork Reduction Act. Does anyone here, presumably it would be either Jen or Shelley, or does anyone in the audience want to say, hey, here's a good way that we, we, we would like to offer feedback in this mechanism. And again, the, 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 the ones that are most heavily used right now is kind of the formal annual reporting process, uh, the, uh, the ad hoc email exchanges, 60% people do it, and then the kind of conversations, presumably informal at site visits, maybe some of them are formal. Are there any ways that you would suggest, hey, here's a way we think that would be a good way to exchange information and get good information to the federal grant-making agencies? We use all three approaches that are, that are listed here. I mean, it's, uh, there, there's no one, one, one right answer. Sure. Did we have a suggestion from the audience? And again, please introduce yourself. Uh, Blanca Rodriguez, Department of Education. Okay. We have a um, annual grantee satisfaction survey. Uh-huh. Uh, we have about 45% um, response rate. 45%? Yes. That's amazing. We have they must think they have to respond in order to get the money. <laughs> <laughs> and does, so you, what, what kinds of information do you get from that? Uh, we um, ask, get information on the quality of the service being provided, the quality of the documents, Mm -hmm. The access to information, especially using technology, mm -hmm. the delivery of services. Okay. I think I mentioned that earlier. How, uh, how many other grants making federal agencies have some sort of survey of their own grant recipients? By show of hands? One other, I need to from the same agency, so that's two agencies, two agencies out of the range, and I think there are probably at least 10 different agencies represented here, so only two of the 10 seem to use a survey at the moment. That's interesting. Um, okay, let's have a look next. Uh, so here the issue was that um, folks were dissatisfied with essentially the kind of the ability of grant recipients to cover the costs of software they perceive they must have, or at least they really would like to have, in order to be able to report into federal grant managers and grantor systems. So they think they're being called upon to provide information and they aren't getting any help or it's expensive to do so. So the question I would have is, what should be done about this? And I, you know, I thought perhaps, Shelley, you, you don't have really a stake in this game as someone who's a kind of an association uh, professional. What, what do you think should be done? Who should pay for it? How should it be paid for? Okay, you might not like my answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what we find is, especially, I think what gets forgotten is the small people that are receiving the grants and that aren't getting a lot of funding. And a lot of them are still on Excel spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. And they lose the perception of, I'm getting funding from five different agencies and I have to have different software. And they forget, it's not that they forget, they don't know that they can write their software off under their grant. And how do they go about doing that is 
will it ever happen? Probably not, but we've kind of started the discussion of creating that one avenue for them to go down. But there's so many different softwares out there and they don't adapt with the feds necessarily is what's the right answer for them. And it's more looking on the small side than the big. Let me ask for the grant recipients in the room. Would you be willing to pay, for example, as I kind of suggested from the GSA side of the, the, the question, you know, one quarter, maybe three quarters of a point on the grant you receive? And so I'm not saying the federal grantor decides, but I'm saying it's up to the grant recipient. Would you as grant recipients be willing to pay that for a system that were offered, whether it be by a private vendor or whether it be by someone like GSA? Would you pay that? Show of hands, how many are grant recipients in the room? And then after showing hands how many grant recipients, how many would be willing to pay, let's pretend a quarter point? Okay, so we've got three or four grant recipients, and all of you would be willing to pay a quarter point? Okay. So again, you know, the, the reason I say quarter point to three quarters point is because that's kind of the range generally of what GSA charges for its acquisition of procurement vehicles, not its grant vehicles. To my knowledge, no one's offering something like this for grants. Okay. Um, so this question was kind of, again, the, uh, these are the things that people found most challenging. And the one thing that they said far and away was most concerning is, I don't know whether I'm going to get this money or not. Maybe this program is going to get zeroed out. Maybe it was zeroed out. Maybe it's going to get refunded by Congress after the administration zeroed it out in the budget. So my question is, what is it that grant managers can do about this uncertainty? And it might make the most sense, perhaps, Stan or Ryan, for, for you to address it kind of from the federal level. How can people deal with this uncertainty? <laughs> Uh, I think from a competitive perspective, we uh, we try to have our notice of funding opportunities teed up and ready to go. I mean, um, as long as the doors are open, uh, it doesn't really matter what the president's budget says. Uh, as, as long as you're working, you can make sure that you're taking steps to define your, define your measures well, define your process well in quarters one and two and uh, hope for the best in terms of, you know, on-time budgets. Uh, if you get an on-time budget, great. If it comes late, you've used quarter one and two well. Quarters three and four are for making awards and then oversight, which, uh, you know, it, it jams things up, but it's not impossible to work around. Any, Stan, any uh, supplement or contrast you want to offer? So from the formula side, uh, the biggest issue we face these days is, is the timing of an annual appropriation. Uh, so many of the mechanisms for our programs date from the 1970s and 1980s as far as mechanisms and time frames are concerned. You turn the clock back and I think that uh, Congress was more regular with delivering the money on time in those days. Uh, you know, looking back over the last quarter century, uh, we really haven't had an appropriation on time as of October 1. And we've gotten our appropriations as late as May 5th, so we're seven months into the fiscal year. Uh, when you have a, a, a set of mechanisms that are geared to money showing up on October 1, uh, as far as the allocation of money, submission of plans, uh, opportunities to begin your, your, your annual program year, uh, if things are geared to January 1, you know, when you say you could begin as early as January 1 and you don't receive the money on May 5th, it's backing your process up. And, and it's not just for the grantees on the front end, it's everybody across the board because it has a ripple effect given the resource issues. Are you allowed to tell us, are you just kind of assuming a March 1 start every year instead of October 1? Well, we, we remain April. hopeful. <laughs> Uh, what about, but, oh, but, but it would be difficult for us to sort of retool our, our systems uh, and processes to uh, allow for that. We do informally encourage grantees who have early program year start dates, let's say January 1 start date, to consider moving them back uh, later in the calendar so that uh, they don't face uh, uh, an interruption in, in funding at the front end of the year. Uh, but uh, again, because an awful lot of our grantees operate peg their their program year to their local fiscal year, that can sometimes be difficult for them to do and and, and, and get loose of those those sort of uh, 
requirements at the local level. So one strategy might be if you're a recipient, hey, adjust your fiscal year start date. That's interesting. Jen, can you give us any idea? You kind of work with a bunch of, of uh, folks, and you're a little closer to some of the recipients in some cases. Are people uh, in the state of Maryland uh, addressing kind of funding uncertainty in other ways, or any suggestions you would make? Um, I'm not sure I have any suggestions. I mean, it's very unpredictable, and I think we've had to do the same kind of adjustments. Um, you know, we hear from the community. I spend a lot of time with nonprofits and organizations across the state. Um, on behalf of the state and trying to bu uh, bridge that gap in communication and it's a it's a concern for you know for everybody um, and I'm not really sure how you know it's very unpredictable so I'm not I, I don't really have a, s a strong recommendation at this time because um, it varies from year to year and from uh, often program to program Let's uh, switch gears for a minute. These are the success factors, and they're far and away the just, most. Sorry? I just, please. On that slide, 2018 is in blue, and it's on the bottom. Yeah. On your next slide, 2018 is in green, is at the top. I just um, want to make sure your slides are correct. Yep. <laughs> I'm going to, we will confirm that. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know whether or not, Regina, are you able to confirm that now, or, or we may have to get back to you, but we will confirm that. Right, that, uh, that is strange, and uh, I apologize for that. Um, so on this slide, though, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that this is the right topic, which is kind of the most frequently supported. So this is the, the question was, you know, what are the things that are most important to your success? Name the two or three most important things, and we gave a list, and then there were, you can fill in your own blank as well if you like. And far and away, the most frequently named thing that was most important to the success of grant management was having well-qualified staff. And so the, what this made me think of is, what is well-qualified staff? And the kind of the question about, uh, you know, how many folks kind of go through college thinking, gee, I want to grow up to be a grant manager. That's my um, line. Which I'm surprised that, <laughs> I, I think there may be a few <laughs> folks who do it, I know one, but I only know one, and I know a lot of grant managers. Um, so my question is, what is well-qualified? Can we define it? Should we have a certification? Shelly, you actually do offer a certification, so I wonder whether or not, you know, maybe uh, the rest of you say, you know, would you want a certification or what would you want in it? And then, if Shelly, if you like, you can uh, describe kind of what the, the, uh, the certification your organization offers is. Okay, so we just laughed in the corner because I said that's my line because I'll say how many people say when they grow up they want to be a grants manager. <laughs> said no kid ever is, I kind of said earlier how when you're looking at the newbies and grants, you get thrown into that position. And especially when you're with these smaller organizations and you're the one-man show, is how you're getting that information. And I'll use me as the plug is whether or not you're a member, is get on our distribution because we work with all the federal granting agencies. And if there's something coming out, we make sure we're on top of letting everybody know. If you're not a member, you just get a little less information. Um, I know that we've had some talks. We do have a certification. It is on the full life cycle of a grant. It does not look at exceptions. It looks at 2 CFR 200. And one of the things that we've had talks about, because there are so many people that are just starting in grants, one, we found nobody leaves grants. Once you're in grants, you're in it for the next 40 years, and they stay put. But um, as the new people are coming in, we're starting to look at more on a certification level and getting a certificate that you're certified in one specific part. The credential that we have looks at ongoing education and continuing education and making sure as the rules and regulations are changing that you're following what they are. Um, we've had some conversations with some of the agencies about required credentialing. And we actually took the opposite approach of making the feds realize from the other perspective that there are these one men show and there's one person in the office and they didn't go to school to grants management for grants management and now they've got to turn in all this paperwork and they don't even know what know what it means that they're not going to have that credential but i know what the feds are starting to look at is a higher tiered requirement and some of the states are actually i think they mentioned carol krauss was on the line and she had to put through her state that if you have so many years experience to stay at a management level, you're gonna have to mean get that CGMS. And there's a couple states that are looking for it so that they know there's somebody on their staff who has this higher tier training and the expertise that can help you on the other side. 
Can so, you spell out CGMS spells out? Certified Grants Management Specialist. Proficiency in the full life cycle of a federal grant. How long does it take someone to earn that credential if they've got a little bit of experience in the field? You, we actually, not officially, have done away with the requirements. There is right now a requirement. There won't be once our system relaunches. Um, we have training on it. It's called Grants Management Body of Knowledge, which is full life cycle training. And it's more for somebody who is intermediate, advanced in grants management. We'll come out with some training this year that's more for the beginner. With the thought being, um, you asked something that I is there a get test? to. Oh, just to get to the test, is the more the concept of the exam is that you work in this every day, and it's not that you took a class and you are able to memorize it to take an exam, is that you are truly proficient in the full life cycle. We ended up with a situation last year where somebody couldn't teach, and I had to go find somebody who had that CGMS to say, if you have the CGMS, while you might not be a presenter, I know you have the knowledge to actually present on every aspect of the um, full life cycle. Stan or Ryan, do you want to offer any thoughts about what is it what is it that means well qualified to you and what do you want from grant managers? It's hard to say. Uh, you know, I think we, we experience people, you know, we experience sort of people across the board. We experience the one the one person show, we experience the large institutional research grant where somebody is doing the financial reports and submitting the progress reports who didn't generate either. Um, we've uh, we experienced sort of the most experienced, maybe no credential, but most experienced thirty years plus. Um, somebody with a lot less than that, maybe thirty months, that is just as good and everything in between. Yes, another question from the live stream audience. It's another comment from um, Lori Beeler from the state of Illinois government. Um, she says, overall, with the amount of time spent on grants management, which Jeff Shelley and Jennifer touched on, the amount could be significantly reduced with training and pursuing certificates available. And so she says that Illinois strongly supports and encourages the certification and working on requiring it for supervisory and management positions. Well, that's interesting. Managers might be more efficient and less burdened if they were better trained. Makes some sense. <laughs> and we support, yeah, I mean, that's kind of our thought as well. You know, um, and as been mentioned over the course of this morning, you know, grants managers, um, they didn't set out typically to do this work. And usually it's out of necessity in the, in the organization or in the agency. And so they find themselves trying to put together these mechanisms for success which they don't really have the grants management background to support it and so you know we love the idea of certification my deputy is CGMS certified and she's a tremendous resource to our state agency um, you know points of contact the challenge would be you know the ongoing cost again you know as as people kind of spend the time and the money to get certified, if there's ongoing costs associated with it and, um, you know, the continuing education, you know, we, we would take that into consideration as well. But, um, you know, we think it's an excellent, um, excellent route to take in the idea. Great. So we're gonna have one last topic fairly briefly, and this is an opportunity for anybody, especially in the audience, to offer your opinions. So the, the picture here with this last part of the survey was, you know what, guidance that's been offered by the government, especially kind of government-wide guidance offered by OMB and or Congress has been generally well received. What all do you think might not be a next topic of guidance or a place where there's uncertainty or discomfort now? What would you say, hey, OMB, we'd like some guidance on X or Y. What would X or Y be? And anybody in the room can answer panelist or no? I'll tell you. I think you have to look at the legislative. Uh, I, I had heard in actually the management concept course that the reason why federal government has been forced to silo all this data was because the state had taken 
I believe it was Medicaid data and something about truancy. Anyway, uh, there was like 50,000 families that were affected in, in the early 80s and then there was a congressional hearing and so on and so forth. So we're kind of in this predicament now where everything is so very siloed. From one perspective, the Data Act kind of crushed that because it's forcing agencies to make all this data publicly available, ideally in a machine-readable format, but at the heart of all this is Congress and legislative body, uh, the legislation is a huge impediment to really making much greater strides to where we can use automation um, while maintaining safeguards and privacy, so on and so forth, but mm -hmm. that is a major piece I feel like has to be overcome. Shelley, does NGMA ever serve as a <laughs> advocate or lobbyist, whereby, for example, a bunch of grant recipients say, hey, we want Congress to change this, but we, as either a, a stakeholder or a federal agency, or lab lobby Congress, or we as an individual grant recipient, may not have a strong enough voice, can we gather together through you and have you advocate for us? Does NGMA do that, or is there any other organization that does that you know of? NGMA will advocate for you individually. We cannot lobby because we support the federal government. Okay. <laughs> so that's an interesting issue, which is it sounds to me like there's not a formal way to do it. Now, the other possibilities, for example, are this group of state grant management directors that Carol Krauss leads and that, that I'm sure that Genesis is a member of and a number of other state grant man uh, managers were aware of or members of. That's a possibility. Um, you know, it, it sounds to me like there's a gap. Uh, the community might need someone who would be able to kind of effectively advocate for its interests before Congress. Just doesn't seem like there's such an entity now unless one of you wants to correct that misimpression. Okay, I think we're pretty much wrapped up. Let me say one last thing uh, and then thank our panelists. The one last thing is la another plug for REI, which is we are hiring grants experts. If you're interested in career options and alternatives, um, we've got a growing business. We'd love to hear from you. Um, but let me also say thank you very much to each of our panelists for sharing your time. And uh, this gift is under $25. It is simply a writing portfolio. Thank you very much. And uh, for any of you who are interested, I suspect they might be available for at least another two or three minutes if you want to ask individual questions.